I am just a big believer all around in simplicity. I also really just don't love doing dishes. <laughs> so, oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm a home cook who writes for other home cooks, so I'm not just thinking about what you might want to eat, but also what's what's it going to be like shopping for this recipe? What's it going to be like cleaning up from this recipe? What's it going to be like if you have leftovers from this recipe? So it's sort of thinking through that whole experience. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm senior editor Anna Huesel, and I'm here with editor-in-chief Matt Rodbard. Today in the show, we have prolific cookbook author and activist Julia Tertian. We also have Chef Dan Holzman answering one of my burning questions. But first up, Anna, what did you and Julia talk about? Julia just wrote a new book called Now and Again, and it's all about leftovers. It's kind of about like an argument in favor of having leftovers at the end of the meal and a million ways to kind of transform them into something that doesn't taste like what you had last night for dinner. Yeah, Julia is a really fascinating character. I love that she is both a collaborator and an activist. She has a lot of, she runs a nonprofit. And I think she's also really famous for collaborating with Gwyneth Paltrow. Did you talk about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. A lot of her early writing projects were um, doing co-authoring cookbooks or ghostwriting cookbooks and kind of channeling a chef or a co-author's voice and cooking style. And it's a really interesting kind of writing. You kind of have to just embody someone else's cooking. We're so pro Julia Tertian here at Taste. Anna, what is one recipe we really need to know about with this book? I love that she has a recipe in the book that's just sliced cantaloupe with lime juice and salt on it. Like, it's so simple, but I love making that for parties. It's so good. That sounds so good because, like, cantaloupe, when you slice it and it's bad, it's like, oh, man. But it sounds like this is a good way to, like, zhuzh it up a little bit. Oh, for sure. It can definitely amp up a a mediocre melon. Here's Anna speaking with Julia Tertian. So this has been an exciting last few years for you. Your book, Small Victories, came out in 2016. Feed the Resistance came out in 2017. And your newest book, Now and Again, is fresh off the press, came out on Beyonce's birthday yes. this year. Easy to remember. <laughs> the title, Now and Again, is kind of a play on the concept, right? Yeah. So it's yeah, it's been a very busy three years. I feel like I'm in the pretty unusual and very privileged position of, yeah, getting to talk about my third book in three years, which is surreal. Yeah, (laughs) Um, wild. Yeah, and but amazing. And I feel really grateful. Yeah, now and again, is definitely kind of a play on the concept. And the concept was a little different to start. And there was also another play on words involved. And it started off just um, with an idea to do a book about reinventing leftovers, because I love leftovers. Um, I love turning them into something new. And I thought that would be a really fun book. And then I thought of the title, It's Me Again, which I thought was the funniest thing <laughs> ever. And Just a little pile of yeah. mashed potatoes emerging from the refrigerator, <laughs> giving a little solemn exactly. wave. There's the cover. It's me again. <laughs> um, but I kept kind of running into a wall when I was thinking about it, because I sort of, I, I do that all the time. I'm always reinventing leftovers. So I was keeping track of it. I was like writing myself little notes. And I was like, I think there's a book here. But I kept, yeah, running into a wall of where does the, you know, if I'm writing recipes for the reinvented leftovers, where does the food come from in the first place? And do I give you that recipe? And, you know, how many variables are kind of okay to work with? And it just seemed maybe not the most useful book um, if there wasn't a little bit more consistency, I guess. So I kind of expanded the idea um, into not just the again, but also the, you know, the first thing. So now and again is what it's now called, if you're still with me. And it's all um, menus and all the, you know, really simple recipes to make those entire meals and then ways to reinvent those leftovers. So it's, you know, you're now and again. So you're both making the leftovers and then making them something totally different. Exactly. Yeah. Before writing out again and before Small Victories and Feed the Resistance, you wrote a lot of cookbooks with collaborators, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, Dana Cowan, Jody Williams. Do you think of those as your books too? And did you find a lot of your personality making 
its way into those books that you worked on earlier on in your career? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I, I think of them as books I worked on and I helped, you know, shepherd in one way or another. Um, but I, I mean, those books are definitely those authors' books. And um, my work on those books is work I've, I've so enjoyed. And I still co-author other books and work in – I basically just love working and I love working on cookbooks um, and to do my own – even though I have been on this kind of crazy pace the last three years, maybe not crazy is the right word, but just um, busy. <laughs> um, I, my own work is, is really personal and I pull from a lot of um, just stories and memories and um, also just, you know, coming up with ideas and everything. So I, you know, I need a little bit of time in between. So during that time, I, you know, I love working on other people's books with them. And I, I just, I love cookbooks. I always have. I love bringing them into this world. And um, yeah, but those books I definitely think of as, you know, whoever authored those books. And, you know, I was I was there to support. I recently reread uh, the Julia Moskin piece from a few years ago in the New York Times about uh, kind of the process of writing a cookbook with a collaborator or sometimes a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a quote in there where you say that it actually helps to be an idiot (laughs) with those kinds of projects and to sort of come to them not as a trained chef necessarily. Yeah. Do you still think that's true? Like, is there (laughs) a certain kind of, like like innocence or naivete that you should come to a project like that with? Yeah, I mean, that is such a blast from the past. I, But I do think um, not being an expert on the topic when you're working with someone on their book is, is a really helpful quality because I think you um, can ask that author questions that – if they're an expert on whatever it is, you know, they might take that information for granted. You know, I, I know I do that in my own work. I, I send recipes to family and friends to test them and everything because I um, – sometimes I don't even realize the things that I just assume. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think having someone there who might not, yeah, fully be an expert can anticipate, you know, home cooks questions and stuff is really helpful. And, you know, I've worked on some books that – a really good example is the Hot Bread Kitchen book. I, I worked on that one, which was a, a dream project. And and, you know, it's it's um, women's stories from all over the world, um, recipes and bread recipes from all over the world. And I had a familiarity, I mean, enough to, you know, kind of have an idea of what was happening. And I, my expertise is in writing and testing recipes and, you know, helping to write narrative when that's needed and everything. So I can come in with that kind of expertise, but then being able to ask all these questions about, you know, why does this one have leavening and this one doesn't? Or, you know, why do you cook it on the stovetop? And, you know, just all those types of things to be able to kind of just fill that book with as much useful information as possible. So, yeah, it, it helps to not to not know everything. And, you know, no one knows everything. And um, it's it's been on my end such a uh, extraordinary experience because I feel like every book I, I work on is I get this kind of crash course in whatever that book is. So, now, you know, having been through the process with just to use Hot Bread Kitchen as an example, like, I now know how to make all that stuff. And that's amazing. Like, yeah. it's so cool. You know, I worked on um, a, a Korean cookbook and I got to learn all these ingredients that I did not grow up with. I got to learn all these recipes. And, you know, those are in my... Um, kind of, you know, I don't know what to call it, arsenal now, you know, like I yeah. use certain things that I, I I didn't use before that project. And um, and I get to bring all of that influence into my own work because I feel like, you know, a lot of people ask me to like describe my food and it's a little hard to describe because it's influenced by all these different things. And For sure. Yeah. Because each of yeah. these individual projects, you kind of become quickly an expert mm-hmm. on the cuisine or the restaurant that you're writing about mm-hmm. or the people or the co-author. Yeah. What is it like to sort of like get inside a collaborator's head Mm -hmm. and try to like embody their cooking style? Do you ever find yourself like falling into the cooking habits of Gwyneth Paltrow? Or like, (laughs) I I mean, I learned so much. Gwyneth would add. (laughs) Yeah, no, I learned so much in that experience. I, um, JJ Good, who also does a lot of co authoring, who's a a friend, and he and I kind of. He writes for taste. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, And JJ and I talk about it a lot, and he refers to the kind of co authoring experience almost like dating. Um, And you are, you know, spending a lot of time with this person, you're learning a lot about them. Um, So I definitely, yeah, I leave every project I work 
on, um, you know, just with new, yeah, information, inspiration. I, the person I'm thinking mostly of right now is um, Jody Williams, and I got to work on her Bouvet b- book with her. Um, that experience was was so transformative for me, and I, you know, the best way I can describe Jody is like there's no behind the scenes. She's absolutely like who she is and what she presents at her restaurants. And I think she's such a um, just unbelievable person and chef. And she, I love her food and I love the experiences she creates and getting to work with her to translate everything that makes that restaurant so special, that tiny, tiny restaurant so impactful. Um, to translate that to the page was really a process of just, yeah, spending so much time with her and um, just asking her a million questions and asking her to tell the story behind everything. And, and actually, to you know, talk about JJ again, he and I talk a lot about in that process how important it is to have whoever you're working with do their thing. So to have you know, Jody cooking while I'm talking to her, as opposed to just, you know, if we sat in a format like you and I are sitting right now, just across from each other at a table, you know, it's a different conversation. But I think if, if you know, if you're, it's this true for anyone, if your hands are involved in something or you're doing something active, I think it's a different stories sort of come up for you. And yeah, like, it yeah. Light on a different yeah. side of your personality yeah. and kind of the part of you that's just comfortable doing yeah. what you do best. Totally. Like I, some of like the most meaningful conversations, like, my wife and I have had have been like when we're on a long drive and I think yeah. it's like you know you're you're doing something like or you know on a long walk or something like where you're you know you're occupied with something else but that isn't it's not you're not so occupied that you can't hold a conversation and I to me that's honestly one of the highest powers of cooking with someone because you get to spend time in a way that's really special and you're you know you're doing something meaningful and you're making something which is cool and great um but you're also able to you know your body language kind of changes and um you can yeah i think spend time together in a way that we don't always get to in kind of the age of being addicted to our phones and yeah i mean i'm talking to myself about the addiction to the phone, but I think it's true for many. JJ writes a column for us at Taste where he writes a little bit about that experience yeah, of writing like what he's learned. Yeah. Yeah, writing uh, books with mm-hmm. chefs. And he sort of talks about the experience a little bit of finding his own voice, his own mm-hmm. writing voice, and also just his own style of home cooking mm-hmm. after working with all these chefs. Yeah. Is it has it been like kind of a relief or has it been fun for you to write small victories and now and again and sort of fall back into your own your own style and your own voice? Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know if relief is the right word, but it's been, um, I mean, the first word that comes to mind is it's just been such a privilege to get to. And I, you know, I have consumed cookbooks since before I can read. I It's really how I learned to cook and it was, I've just loved them my whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, I have always... Yeah, flip through them, read them, fallen asleep to them. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're sitting in one of the biggest publishing offices in the world. And I think, you know, I think something that is true is that the world doesn't need another cookbook. I mean, there are so many, but I definitely yeah, believe... Yeah, we, we can call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> we're done here. But I think that the world can never have enough stories. And I think that cookbooks are these vessels of incredible storytelling. And I think food is the vehicle to the story. And I mean, just the whole process of creating recipes is, um, I love it. And I think it's super fun. And you can get really nerdy on the details and the whole testing process and everything. And it's a part of my work. It's a very kind of cerebral part of my work that I really enjoy. Um, But I think that in terms of the stories behind the recipes, that's what's always drawn me to cookbooks. Um, and those stories are told not just through the words, but the pictures and everything. And the thing that rings true in any story is the voice and, you know, who's telling it. And I, I just believe so much. And if I'm going to work on my own stuff, it should only be a story I can tell. And, you know, I try to never just fill space just to fill it. You know, I if I don't have enough stories, if my voice isn't there for all of it, then it's not, you know, that book's not ready yet. <laughs> um, so if I'm not doing that for my own work, you know, how fun and amazing to get to work with other people and stories only they can tell. You know, Jody is the only one who can tell the Bouvette story, you know, and on and on. So it's, you know, I'm game to, 
yeah, work on anything where where someone's voice is really there and it's it's the story that they can tell. Yeah, and it's about more than just the recipes. And yeah. also the recipes tell their own stories yeah, as well. Yeah, totally. I want to talk about some of the recipes in Now and Again, awesome. which are really exciting to me. Thank you. I was stoked to see uh, recipes like the salty cantaloupe <laughs> and the cucumbers with sumac uh-huh. um, and pineapple with tagine. Um, Lots I love, of stuff sprinkled. On stuff. Yeah, I love that because I love having parties um, and I will find any excuse I can not to make a salad, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like any kind of like, oh, I'll just sprinkle some mm-hmm. seeds on a vegetable yeah. and, that, and that kind of and there becomes, you go. Yeah. yeah. So I love that approach, yeah. kind of like taking two simple ingredients and making it. Yeah. Making it something thoughtful. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so much of now and again, because it is, you know, it's broken down into seasons and each season has, you know, a couple of menus. And the to me, writing a menu is, you know, it goes back to what we were just talking about. It's about storytelling. So it's, you know, what supporting characters (laughs) do you need? And, you know, whether you have one central main dish or like a few things that kind of anchor a meal, you know, the supporting cast, if, if you will, like, not everything has to be complicated, and like sometimes, right. yeah, a platter of sliced you put cucumbers out a is a little like, bowl of saltines, yeah. with a cup of soup, a thousand percent, yeah, and it like really, it just makes that a more complete thing, and it's you know that soup's not just sitting there by itself, and yeah, tuck a few crackers or a piece of bread, whatever, yeah. and you've got like a more kind of complete story. So uh, yeah, I am just a big believer all around in simplicity, and um, I also really. Just don't love doing dishes. <laughs> so, oh, for sure. you know, I always think I, um, you know, I'm a home cook who writes for other home cooks. So I'm not just thinking about what you might want to eat, but also what's, what's it going to be like shopping for this recipe? What's it going to be like cleaning up from this recipe? What's it going to be like if you have leftovers from this recipe? So it's sort of thinking through that whole experience. Yeah, absolutely. I love salty melon. People always find that combination so strange, but to me, it just kind of like, yeah, and your your recipe or suggestion? Yeah, I don't even know. I wouldn't call it a recipe. The, yeah, there's like a little sprinkle yeah. of lime juice uh-huh. and salt, and yeah. I think it just brings out all of the yeah. all of the good kind of acidic yeah. characters totally. of the melon. Yeah, I think like lemon or lime or any acid and salt are just like the to me they're like the volume knobs. Yeah. <laughs> like let's just turn this up a little bit. And yeah, I think salt on fruit is it's super common in so many countries that aren't. America. <laughs> so right. it's yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. not something I came up with, but it's something I enjoy and I think it's worth mentioning. I was excited to see that you have a crab cake recipe in the book <laughs> also because I, I feel like you never see that in a mm-hmm. cookbook anymore. Um, and yours is really clever and it's not like a crab cake recipe I've seen in any other books. Can you tell us about Yeah. So it's um, – it's so all of the recipes in the book that are um, part of the sort of quote unquote now, like the the menus, uh, are written as kind of formal recipes, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't mean stuffy. I just mean like there's a list of ingredients and instructions, and you know what I think we all think about as recipes, and then. Um, in the f- following the menus and all the suggestions for leftovers, which all come under that um, very cheeky title, it's me again. <laughs> are they're written much more casually? Um, so. I thought of the writing process of those more like, um, and the following does happen all the time, like when my dad um, emails me and is like, I have half a roast chicken in the mm-hmm. fridge, like what should I do with it? Um, yeah. you, so ne- you never plan on having yeah. half of a leftover yeah. chicken, it just happens. Yeah, so the um, crab cake is one of the leftover ideas, um, and it's for, um, the original recipe is for this crab toast, which is super simple, and um, yeah, just, you know, thick toast kind of rubbed with the garlic clove to give it a little you know extra flavor and then like a super simple crab salad and I should mention that's one of the only recipes in the book that really calls for like a pretty special expensive ingredient but it's Mm -hmm. um you know a little goes a long way and uh it's a it's a celebratory meal and it's just I think to me like a crab salad on toast is just one of the most delicious things (laughs) and and if there's any leftover from that which there might not be because you know, they're delicious. Yeah. Um, but it's part of a pretty big meal, so there might be some leftovers. So the idea for that is to basically toast and all, just chop that all up and f- form little crab cakes and crisp them up in a pan and enjoy them. And I think, uh, you know, I think the leftover kind of concept of the book is obviously super practical. Um, but I think that there are kind of like, um, I don't know, kind of 
echoes to it that are even more meaningful of just like, you know, taking something that is really good and just extending its life a little bit more. And, yeah. you know, and just I think the idea of reinvention in general. And, you know, we, yeah. we all deserve a second chance. <laughs> I love that crab cake idea because I think it's like kind of funny. I I kind of dread having leftovers, but I think it's kind of like funny and liberating to take like a beautifully composed hors d'oeuvre mm-hmm. and just kind of like obliterate yeah, it and turn totally. it into something totally new. Yeah, there's some it's freedom like in that. Fun. Yeah, I think a lot of the kind of leftover ideas sort of, because the whole point is to not have the same thing again. And I have, I should say, I have no issue with like reheating something and, you know, having that as another meal or just, you know, cold pizza or certain things you don't have to mess with. Yeah. Um, but I think in general, I wanted to give really creative and fun ideas um, just to kind of remind, you know, myself and anyone else who picks it up that like, you know, things can be something different. And um, and it kind of goes hand in hand yeah. with like the philosophy about hospitality that there should always be more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of is like motivation to just make sure everyone's very well fed. Yeah. But also there, yeah. there will be lots yeah. of Yeah. Like my Aunt Renee, who's no longer with us, she was a very kind of, um, I don't know if you'd say famous or infamous <laughs> cook in our family because it was, she, you know, if two people came over, she made enough food for 20. And, oh, sure. That's know, just practical. Yeah, totally. And um, I think that idea of just abundance and, um, and uh, yeah, taking care of people. And to me, it's why I... I love to cook for people and I love to cook for people I love and I love to cook for people I I don't know and I want to know better. And I think that feeling of um, taking care of people and I think, you know, the feeling, you know, hopefully we've all experienced of someone doing that for you and how amazing that feels and to just have um, abundance and to have plenty, um, but then to also not be wasteful and to be resourceful. And and it it also, for me, comes from a really um, practical place, not just like a you know, cooking too much, just to cook too much. I, uh, my wife Grace and I live in a really rural area, so we we eat every meal at home, and so we're always making more than we need for just that meal. Because um, I don't, you know, I love cooking you so much, but spend like, all yeah, of your time but I don't need it. to start from scratch every time it's time for a meal. So, yeah. yeah, that place of plenty really continues to serve serve us. Yeah. In the midst of all your writing, you also earlier this year launched Equity at the Table, um, which was really exciting for all of us food writers and food editors. How has that kind of changed? Have you noticed that kind of changed the industry just since April, since you launched? Yeah. And what's um, what's been happening? Yeah. Since what's then? going on with Eat? So yeah, no, thanks for for um, using it or knowing about it, and it's it's. I'm so thrilled anytime any um, editor or writer. Uh, mentions it um, because I'm just so glad to know it's on your radar. And yeah, it's an inclusive digital directory. Um, It's a directory of women and non-binary individuals in food, and it focuses primarily on people of color and LGBTQ community. And, you know, it's hard to say if I've noticed it changing the industry. I have... I have heard from a lot of people who are using it, and that just makes me really happy. And it's that's what it's there for. It's a tool and it's a resource. And I love knowing that, um, you know, if someone is looking to hire someone, you know, whether it's a, a chef or a, someone who writes about food or a photographer, or food stylist, whatever it might be, that, you know, there's this resource. Or, you know, if you're planning a, um, a conference or an event or something like that. So... What I have definitely noticed and what feels very tangible to me is um, not just people, especially people in positions of power coming to the site to, you know, find people. The other thing that has been equally meaningful and powerful, if not even more so, is um, watching the members of the site, myself included, just connect with other members and to watch this community itself kind of come together and get to know each other and um, support each other and kind of lift each other up. And uh, that's been really cool. And one thing that started just very organically was um, I was hearing from some people who had a job opening or um, had an event or, you know, something that they wanted to let the, uh, you know, eat members. So equity at the table is eat with two T's. So I call it eat and kind of linger on that T. Um, you know, they wanted to let eat members know about. So I um, collect everyone's email addresses in case I have to, you know, let them know something is, you know, but we don't put those emails on the site just for 
you know, privacy or whatever. But um, I realized I had everyone's emails. So I started just sending an email like, hey, there's a job opening here. Or, hey, there's an event here that they would love to, you know, see us at if anyone's around or um, and that's just grown into a regular thing I send out. And it's like this really easy place to just share also just news like, hey, so and so wrote this piece. Like, it's awesome. Um, hey, someone was on the taste podcast, like have a listen, you know, whatever it might be. So it's been just a cool way for us to all kind of, uh, you know, stay in touch and be aware of what everyone's working on. And um, I think so much of the impetus behind Eat was like, um, you know, I think a, a feeling that, um, you know, it's a, we're in a pretty, I don't know, oversaturated industry, I guess. And I think lots of people operate, especially if you're in a marginalized community from such a place of scarcity of feeling like there's not room for me or for us. Um, and I think something that feels really um, meaningful to me about EAT is like, oh, we can create space for each other. And um, yeah, so that's Was been great. Was there a particular moment in your career where you kind of like realized that there was a need for this and that there was this gap uh, that to create space yeah, for a yeah. table? Yeah, I think that, um, I, I mean, I basically feel like I kind of assumed something like it already existed and I just didn't know about it. And then I went looking for it and couldn't find it um, in a way as comprehensive as EAT is. There's like great lists that exist of, you know, women chefs or other stuff like that that are super useful and awesome. Um, and But I, I couldn't find something that, you know, the food industry is so many industries under one umbrella. So EAT represents, you know, over 40 professions. You know, yeah. it's really chefs, extensive. Chefs, writers, farmers, yeah. farmers. Yeah, it kind of goes on. And, and we keep adding new things because I, you know, I, I put together an advisory board when when it started, and, and part of our um, process was just like, you know, which profession should we include? And even with you know, including me, seven of us, kind of really thinking about it, like there was just stuff none of us thought of. And you know, I, I hear from people all the time, like, hey, can you add? Um, you know, I I make cheese, and that was not something I thought of. Um, so now we have a section for people who work in cheese, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, it just keeps expanding, which is, is super cool. And in terms of um, like a moment when I thought about it, yeah, I was sort of looking for it, mostly because I feel like I kept writing the same email over and over, honestly, where um, someone would, um, you know, maybe, you know, as a cookbook author, you um, end up, you know, like, well, it's not automatic, but I think, you know, being invited to certain conferences or being part of a panel or something, and then, you know, looking around and seeing, you know, I, um, you know, I'm a proud and very out gay woman, but I am a white woman and looking around and seeing that it was only other white people on the panel. And I was like, you know, hey, could you invite someone else? And then I would get a lot of um, emails asking, sure, but I don't know who to reach out to. And I just heard that over and over. Um, and I was like, here's a list of 20 people off the top of my head. Here's a list of, you know, however many people that fit whatever this thing is. Um, and honestly, I just was like, it would be great to just send a link <laughs> to something. Yeah. And that is like really... Make it as yeah. easy as possible. Yeah. Easy. It's free to join. It's free to use. You know, there's no barrier to entry. And it also is like, you know, it makes it pretty, I don't know, sort of undeniable that there's lots of us here. There's lots of queer people and people of color. And we're all doing this work. And, and we're right here. And you can yeah. just, you know click <laughs> yeah yeah so it's grown a lot it's yeah. grown and evolved a lot mm -hmm. it started just mm -hmm. a few months ago and do you have do you think you'll do you'll move into other forms of media or do you think you'll have events eventually what do you yeah do you think it will turn into you know it's so interesting because um uh, eat as it is is exactly what I envisioned. You know, I yeah. I thought about a, a database <laughs> about yeah. this kind of digital tool, and that is what exists. And I think it's so interesting because I think we live in such a culture of like, okay, how are you going to scale this? What's next? What's next? And there's a part of me that feels like it is exactly what it is. <laughs> like, yeah. It doesn't have to be, you know, everything. And but at the same time, I think it does have. It's such a powerful community, and I think that. Um, there's so much that we can do together. So I actually recently sent out a survey to all the members to kind of hear feedback because I can think of ideas. The advisory board can think of ideas, but I wanted 
if we do anything, you know, I want it to be based on what the community wants and needs. Um, so there's definitely a real, I guess I should say, hunger <laughs> for in-person connection. Um, and I think this connection we feel through through the site, through the emails, through we have an Instagram page, um, you know, is, is awesome. Um, but I think there's such a desire to get together in person. And I think my sense is like that will probably be really casual, just like, hey, eat member in San Francisco, like invite everyone over to a bar for happy hour or whatever yeah. it might be, you know. Um, so I think we'll probably do that. And yeah, I've I've had a fun time, you know, thinking in my own head and talking to the advisory board about ideas of like, it could be, you know, it could be a speaker's bureau, it could be a literary agency, you know, it could represent all the members, it could be its own media platform, it could be all these things It also could just be what it is. And that would, it would be great. Still be doing yeah, its job. yeah. Yeah, well, I am so excited to cook out of your book. Thank you. And I'm so excited to see everything else you do with Equity at the Table. Thank Thank you you. so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Here's Chef Dan Holtzman answering one of Matt's burning food questions. My question today is, let's talk about MSG. The question is, I don't want to know if it's good or bad because we know it's good. Everyone who knows anything says it's not bad for you. But I want to know, how do I cook with the shaker of MSG that I bought at the bodega? You're amazing. Trend Alert 2019, monosodium glutamate. If you want to you know, get monosodium glutamate as, as quickly as possible, delivered into your food stuff, take basically 10% of the salt weight or, you know, like a teaspoon for every quarter cup, let's say, of salt and just season as you normally would. So mix the MSG with the salt and then season as you normally would. What am I putting it on? Am I putting it directly on raw meat? Am I putting it on cooked vegetables? Am I putting it on raw fish? Does so it matter? I I would add it to a sauce. I add MSG to a sauce. Um I add MSG to a, a force meat. Like when I'm making a meatball, I can add MSG directly into the meat mixture. And then I can also add it almost like a you would a fleur de sel or a seasoning salt afterwards as a sprinkle as the first thing that touches your tongue because it kind of like, you know, primes it for – It wakes it up in a way, right? It's like it's like a flavor explosion. Well, I, we, we did a test. We don't use MSG at the restaurants that I'm associated with because, you know, it has a negative connotation – or at least I don't tell people I do um, on podcasts. But you know, we did a test where we where we made food with and without MSG, and then asked people to taste them blindly. And they were, they, you know, they would say like, "This food is too salty, or it's too spicy, or it's too meaty, or it's they 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 never kind of identified anything as being anything other than it enhancing the inherent flavor. So you and the blind test actually had negative results for MSG because it was just like overpowering it. If you're going to use MSG, I would suggest being a little more subtle with the spices to begin with because it's going to enhance whatever flavor is there. When was the last time you cooked with MSG at home? I cook with MSG at home almost like yesterday. I made this delicious shrimp and squid with squash and corn and uh my my dry cleaner or my like laundry guy cans his own tomatoes he's like an italian dude from from and he gave me some canned tomatoes delicious little msg made him even more delicious <laughs> thanks for joining dan appreciate it the pleasure was all was all yours you're welcome The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.